I am going to announce a quota of 25% women deputy secretaries and permanent secretaries to be achieved within the next four years. Now, wait a minute, Minister. Why? Well, I'm obviously in total sympathy with your objectives. Obviously. Of course we must have more women at the top. Of course. And all of us are deeply concerned by this apparent imbalance, but these things take time. And I want to make a start straight away. I agree wholeheartedly. And I propose we make an immediate start by setting up an interdepartmental committee no, no, and forming no, no, the... No, 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 that's not what I meant, and you know it. I don't want the usual delaying tactics. This needs a sledgehammer. We must cut through the red tape. No, you can't cut tape with a sledgehammer, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Minister, you do me an injustice. I was not about to suggest delaying tactics. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's all right, Minister. I was about to suggest that if we are to have a 25% quota of women, we need a much larger intake at the recruitment stage so that eventually there will be 25% in the top jobs. When? In, in 25, 25 years. years. No. <laughs> you haven't got quite my drift. I mean now. Oh. You mean now? Got it in 100. Uh, Minister, it takes time to do things now. <laughs> <laughs> the three articles of civil service faith. It takes longer to do things quickly, it's more expensive to do them cheaply, and it's more democratic to do them in secret. No. <laughs> I have suggested four years, and I think that's masses of time. Oh, dear me, no. I don't mean political time, I mean real time. Civil servants are grown like... like oak trees. Not mustard and cress. <laughs> they bloom and ripen with the seasons. They mature like, ah, uh, like... Like yourself. Uh, well, I was about to say like an old port. Like Grimsby, perhaps. <laughs> yes, I was being serious, Minister. <laughs> yes, I foresaw this problem. And I propose we solve it by bringing in top women from outside the service to fill vacancies in the top jobs. I don't think I quite understood. Watch my mouth, Humphrey. <laughs> we will bring in women from outside. But the whole strength of the system is that it is incorruptible, pure and unsullied by outside influences. People move from job to job throughout industry. Why should the civil service be different? Well, the civil service is different. It demands subtlety. Discretion. Devotion to duty. Soundness. Soundness. Well said, Bernard. <laughs> civil servants require endless patience and boundless understanding. They need to be able and willing to change horses midstream as the politicians change what they are pleased to call their minds. And you have all these talents, Humphrey. Well, it is just that one has been properly, um... Matured, like Grimsby. <laughs> Strange. No, Humphrey, ask yourself seriously, if there isn't something wrong with the system, why are there so few women deputy secretaries? Well, they keep leaving to have babies and things. Babies? At the age of nearly 50, surely not. Well, I don't know, Minister. Really, I don't. I'm on your side. We really do need more women at the top. Good, because I'm not waiting 25 years. There's a vacancy for deputy secretary in this department, isn't there? Yes. I shall appoint a woman, Sarah Harrison. Sarah Harrison? I think she's very able, don't you? Very able for a woman, for a person. A very able person. <laughs> And she has ideas. She is an original thinker. Yes, I'm afraid that's true, but she doesn't let it interfere with her work. <laughs> what have you got against her? Nothing. I think she's quite excellent. I'm a great supporter of hers. I advocated her promotion last year to undersecretary at a very early age. Would you agree that she is an outstanding undersecretary? Yes. So on balance, it is a good idea. On balance, yes and no. <laughs> it's not a very clear answer, Humphrey. It's a balanced answer. Well, I must say that it seems right and proper to me that men and women be treated fairly and equally. Mm. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that we all feel that, in principle, there should be such targets set and goals achieved. Yeah, yeah, in principle. Yeah, yeah. Bill? <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm fully in favour of this idea. We must have some positive discrimination in favour of women. Of course, it wouldn't work with the foreign and Commonwealth Office for obvious reasons. I mean, we couldn't post women ambassadors to Iran or any of the Muslim nations. Oh, quite right. Right. Most of the third world are not so advanced as we are in connection with women's rights, and as we have to send uh, diplomats to new postings every three years, this idea is obviously not for us, but I do applaud the principle. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. I'm all in favour of it. I, I think we need the feminine touch. Uh, women are better at handling some problems than men, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, of course, we would have to make an exception as far as the Home Office is concerned. Uh, women are not the right people to run prisons or the police. 
And quite probably they wouldn't want to do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but you do agree with the principle? Oh, yes, without no question. <laughs> Peter? Well, yes, the same applies to defence. Alas, all those admirals and generals. And it wouldn't be possible, of course, to appoint a woman as head of security, for instance. M would have to become F. <laughs> <laughs> yes, defence is clearly a man's world, like industry and employment, and all those is. trade union leaders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what about the DHSS, John? Well, I'm happy to say that women are well represented near the top of the DHSS. You know, after all, we have two of the four deputy secretaries currently in Whitehall. Uh, not eligible for permanent secretary, of course, because they're deputy chief medical officers, and I'm not sure they're really suitable for... Uh, uh, no, no, that's unfair. Of course, women are 80% of our clerical staff and 99% of the typing grade, so we're not doing too badly by them, are we? <laughs> and in principle, I'm in favour of them going to the very top. Good, good. Well, I think the feeling of the meeting is, in principle, that we're all thoroughly in favour of equal rights for the ladies. Yeah, yeah. It's just that there are certain special problems in individual departments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what about this question of the quota? Frankly, I must tell you that I'm against it. Very yes, well, not well, politicians, I know. We must, in my view, always have the right to promote the best man for the job, regardless of sex. No. <laughs> And speaking as an ardent feminist myself, I think that the problem lies in recruiting the right sort of women. Married women with families tend to drop out because, in all honesty, they cannot give their work their full single-minded attention. And unmarried women with no children are not fully rounded people with a thorough understanding of life. Yeah. <laughs> so that in practice, it's rarely possible to find a fully rounded married woman with a happy home and three children who's prepared to devote her whole life, or virtually her whole life, to a department. It's catch-22, really. Well. Catch-22, sub-paragraph A. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we must ensure that our respective ministers oppose this quota idea in Cabinet by drawing our own minister's attention to each department's own special problems. Mm. Uh, but we will, of course, uh, recommend the principle of equal opportunities at every level. Uh, uh, principle. principle. Yes. yes. Uh, may I say just one more thing? Please. Through the chair, I'd like to add that my minister also sees the promotion of women as a means of creating greater diversity the top of a service. I think we should stress when briefing our ministers that, quite frankly, you couldn't find a more diverse lot than us. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. A real cross-section of the nation. Yeah. <laughs> but surely you don't intend to tamper with the democratic rights of freely elected local government representatives? Well, <laughs> no, of course not. Local government isn't democratic. Local democracy is a farce. And the vast majority of people don't even know how their councillor is. And they never vote in a local election. And those who do simply regard it as a popularity poll for the government here in Westminster. Local councillors, in practice, are accountable to nobody. They're public-spirited citizens, selflessly sacrificing their spare time. Have you ever met any? Occasionally, when there was no alternative. <laughs> half of them are self centered busybodies on an ego trip, and the other half are in it for what they can get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps they ought to be in the House of Commons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to see how a proper legislative assembly behaves. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to get a grip on them. I have a plan. You have a plan? <laughs> yes. I'm going to insist that any local official who puts up a plan costing more than say, £10,000, must accompany it with failure standards. With what? <laughs> with a statement saying that he will have failed if his project does not achieve certain preset results <laughs> or exceeds <laughs> fixed time or staff or budget limits. Minister, where did you get the idea for this dangerous nonsense? From someone in the department. Minister, I have warned you before about the dangers of speaking to people in the department. <laughs> I implore you to stay out of the minefield of local government. It is a political graveyard. Uh, but excuse me, Sir Humphrey, you cannot have a graveyard in a minefield <laughs> because all the corpses would... <laughs> but you got me this job, you said. Yes, but I didn't expect you to do anything. <laughs> I mean, you've never done anything before. Griff, <laughs> I am deaf to your complaints. No, no, please, I no, beg no, you. No, 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 Humphrey. 
I want specific proposals straight away and immediate plans for their implementation by local government. I don't know why you're in such a fuss about anyway. I'm only proposing failure standards for local government, not here in Whitehall. <laughs> Though, come to think of it... <laughs> if you insist on interfering in local government, may I make a suggestion that could prove a very real vote winner? Humphrey, I want to hear no more about it. <laughs> vote winner? An area of local government that needs urgent attention. What? Civil defence. <laughs> You mean fallout shelters? Surely they're just a joke. Precisely, Minister. At the moment, they are a joke. Local authorities are dragging their feet, but the highest duty of any government is to protect its citizens. Some people think that the building of shelters makes nuclear war more likely. Well, if you have the weapons, you must have the shelters. I sometimes wonder why we need the weapons. Minister, you're not a unilateralist. <laughs> sometimes wonder, you know. Well, then you must resign from the government. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not that unilateralist. <laughs> in any case, the Americans will always protect us from the Russians, won't they? Russians? Who's talking about the Russians? Well, the independent deterrent. It's to protect us against the French. <laughs> <laughs> That's astounding. Why? Well, they're our allies, our partners. Well, they are now. But they've been our enemies for most of the past 900 years. <laughs> and if they got the bomb, we must have the bomb. Oh. Wow. There is considerable disquiet about the BBC's attitude and hostility towards the government. But that's absurd. Is it? Well, they've been documenting instances of bias in uh, BBC Current Affairs. Favourable news stories not reported. Oh, yes, excessive publicity for other countries' case against Britain, especially our common market enemies. <laughs> um, partners. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Jokes against the Prime Minister. <laughs> Unnecessary publicity for anti-government demonstrations and uh, ministers' programmes. Suggestions not accepted. <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't have room in my case for the others. But, but, but I, I, I'm sure we've got answers to all these. Of course, the BBC's always got answers. Silly ones, but it's got them. Yes, <laughs> of course. But I thought it only fair to warn you that questions are being asked. What sort of questions? Uh, well, for example, uh, were Parliament to be televised, whether it shouldn't be entrusted to ITV? Oh, to serious. And whether the BBC administration is actually making the cuts in jobs and premises that we've endured in, in government. And should a select committee be appointed to scrutinise BBC expenditure? But that would be an intolerable intrusion. Well, of course. And then, of course, there's this extraordinary matter of the boxes at Ascot, Wimbledon, Lords, Cotton Garden and the Proms. Ah, uh, yes, well, those are technical requirements. Ah. Uh, production and engineering staff. Hmm. Reports from the... Inland Revenue suggests that the production and engineering staff are all holding champagne glasses <laughs> and are all accompanied by their wives or ladies of equal <laughs> distinction <laughs> and all bear remarkable similarity to governors, directors and executives of the uh, corporation and their friends. <laughs> oh, I say, you've come out very well, haven't you? <laughs> Mind you, it is just possible that we might be able to contain all this criticism, provided the files don't get any larger. And I've been urging my minister that there's really no need to take up this case of the civil defence issue formally. But, 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 but you must see my position. <laughs> the BBC cannot give in to government pressure. No, no, of course not. We wouldn't want them to, would we, Minister? Wouldn't we? No, of course not. <laughs> but you see, the Minister's interview with Ludovic Kennedy did contain some factual errors. Factual errors? Mm. Ah, well, now, that's different. I mean, as you know, the BBC couldn't give in to government pressure. Oh, absolutely mm. not. But we do set great store by factual accuracy. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> but you see, some of the information in the interview might well be out of date by the time of out transmission. Out of date, yes. out of date. Ah, well, now, that's serious. I mean, obviously, the BBC, I mean, as you know, couldn't possibly give in to government pressure. Oh, indeed not. <laughs> no, absolutely but not. we do not want to transmit out-of-date material. Yeah, and since the recording, I realise that I made one or two inadvertent slips that might have security implications. Such as? 
He can't tell you what they are. <laughs> Why not? Security. <laughs> I'm probably too careful about security, I do agree. If the defense of the realm is at stake, well, we do have to be very responsible. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the BBC couldn't give in to government pressure. <laughs> no, absolutely. But security, well, you can't be too careful. Can't yet. be too can't careful. Be too careful yeah. you say. No, if there are inaccuracies mm. and security worries, well, mm. the BBC wouldn't want to put the interview out. Precisely. That puts a completely different complexion completely on it. Completely different. different yeah. complexion <laughs> on it. The transmission would not be in the public's interest. But I must make one thing absolutely clear. Yes? There can be absolutely no question of the BBC ever giving in to government pressure. Bernard, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy about disciplining South Derbyshire. Oh, why not, Minister? Instinct. Dr. Cartwright seemed to be trying to tell me something. I think I'll drop in on him. Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that, Minister. Why not? Well, it is understood if ministers want to know anything, it will be brought to their notice. If they go out looking for information, they might... Uh, well, they might... Find it? Yes. <laughs> uh, Sir Humphrey does not take kindly to the idea of ministers just dropping in on people. Going walkabout, he calls it. The Queen does it? Well, I, I don't think she drops in on undersecretaries, not in Sir Humphrey's department. What's his room number? I must formally advise you against this, Minister. Advice noted. Room 4017. <laughs> Down one flight, second corridor on the left. If I'm not back in 48 hours, send out a search party. <laughs> Hello, Graham. It's Bernard. Look, I think you better tell Sir Humphrey that the Minister's just gone walkabout. Yes. Yes, AWOL. <laughs> well, of course I told him, yes. I know. I think you better let him know right away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's all this about? <laughs> uh, the minister's just left the office, Sir Humphrey, that's all. That's all? Do you mean he's loose in the building? <laughs> Why didn't you warn me? Well, I did advise him, Sir Humphrey, but he is the minister. And there's no statutory prohibition of, against ministers talking to their staff, is there? Who is he talking to, Bernard? Perhaps he was just restless. If the minister's restless, Bernard, he can feed the ducks in St James's Park. <laughs> yes, Sir Humphrey, yes. And now tell me who the minister's talking to. Well, surely the minister can talk to anyone. Bernard. I'm in the middle of writing your annual report. <laughs> now, it is not a responsibility that either of us would wish me to discharge whilst I'm in a bad temper. Who's the minister talking to? Well, perhaps you could help me with this, Sir Humphrey. Mm -hmm. I can quite see that you should be told if the minister calls on an outsider, but I fail to see why you should be informed if he just wants to... Uh, to take a hypothetical example, mm. to check a point with Dr. Cartwright. Thank or... you, Bernard. My... <laughs> <laughs> Room 4017. I know. <laughs> so all those things they told me about South Derbyshire Council, are they true? They may be, for all I know. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying that, nevertheless, South Derbyshire is the most efficient local authority in the UK. The most efficient? I'm supposed to be ticking them off for being the least efficient. Look at the figures. I thought they didn't send us any. No. <laughs> but they keep their own records perfectly well. I'm going on those. Look. Oh. They've got the lowest truancy record in the Midlands. <laughs> the lowest administrative cost per council house. Lowest ratio in Britain of council workers to rate income. A clean bill of public health with the lowest number of environmental health officers. What are environmental health officers? Rat catchers. <laughs> Virtually all the children can read and write, even though they've had a progressive education. <laughs> oh, yes, and they've got the smallest establishment of social workers in the UK. Is that supposed to be a good thing? Oh, yeah. Sign of efficiency. Mm. Parkinson's law of social work, you see. It's well known that social problems increase to occupy the total number of social workers available to deal with. <laughs> Minister, I think there is something that perhaps you ought to know. Yes, Humphrey. 
the identity of the official whose alleged responsibility for this hypothetical oversight has been the subject of recent discussion is not shrouded in quite such impenetrable obscurity as certain previous disclosures <laughs> may have led you to assume. But not to put too fine a point on it, the individual in question is, it may surprise you to learn, one whom your present interlocutor <laughs> is in the habit of defining by means of the perpendicular pronoun. <laughs> Beg your pardon? <laughs> it was I. <laughs> no. I was under pressure. <laughs> we were overworked. There was panic. <laughs> Parliamentary questions table. Well, obviously, I'm not a trained lawyer, or I wouldn't have been in charge of the legal unit. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> It was 30 years ago. Everybody makes mistakes. Well, Humphrey, I forgive you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Minister. Why didn't you tell me about this before, Humphrey? We have no secrets from each other, have we? That is for you to say, Minister. Well, not entirely. Anyhow, what are we going to do? I'm going to be roasted if I don't release the, all those papers to the mail. Of course, I might be able to do something about it. I haven't got this other worry on my plate. What other worry? <laughs> Being roasted by the press for disciplining the most efficient council in Great Britain. Ah. Do you know, Minister, I've been thinking about South Dark. <laughs> Oh, good. Obviously, we can't change the law, but perhaps we might show them a little leniency, you know, private word to the chief executive, give them a chance to mend their ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that might help considerably. Mm -hmm. but how am I going to explain the missing documents to the mail? Well, this is what we normally do in <laughs> circumstances like these. This file contains the complete set of papers Except for a number of secret documents, a few others which are part of still active files, some correspondence lost in the floods of 1967. <laughs> Was 1967 a particularly bad winter? No, a marvellous winter. We lost no end of embarrassing files. <laughs> some records which went astray in the move to London, and others when the War Office was incorporated in the Ministry of Defence, and the normal withdrawal of papers whose publication could give grounds for an action for libel, or breach of confidence, or cause embarrassment to friendly governments. Well, that's pretty comprehensive. And how many does that normally leave for them to look at? How many does it actually leave? About 100? 50? 10? 5? 4? <laughs> Two, one, <laughs> zero. Yes, Minister. Oh, excuse me, Minister. There's an urgent call for you in the communications room. A uh, Mr. Haig. <laughs> General Haig? Uh, no, Mr. Haig. You know, with the dimples. <laughs> yes. uh, excuse me. Most important. I believe there's a message for me from Mr. Haig. Yes, Minister. I'm the only woman here. Yes, yeah, special dispensation. They've made you an honorary man for the evening. This is going to look wonderful on the corner table in our hall. Oh, well, actually, Mrs. Hacker, I'm not sure if... If what? Well, you see, it's a gift to the Minister. Well, it's his hall, too. Uh, no, what I mean is, I don't think you'll be allowed to keep it. Why ever not? Well, I suppose it could be thought if it were valuable, it could influence some ministers. I mean, not your minister, that is my minister. Our minister. Uh, your husband, <laughs> as, it, uh, as it is, in fact. I mean, he is. I mean, well, some ministers... Bernard! Uh, sorry. 
Are you telling me we have to give it back? Oh, no, no, that would be an insult. We can't keep it. We can't give it back. What do I do? Well, it becomes the property of the government and it's put in a basement somewhere in Whitehall. Are you sure we can't keep it? Not if it's worth more than about 50 pounds. How do we find out? You get a valuation. Could you get a valuation? Well, Wouldn't it be wonderful if it was less than 50 pounds because it's awfully pretty? Well, I... <laughs> I suppose I could try. Oh, Bernard, you are wonderful. I don't know what we'd do without you. Oh, uh, Bernard. Yes, yes. Wanted in the communications room, Mr. John Walker. <laughs> Johnny Walker? Yes, from the Scotch office. <laughs> Scottish office. Isn't there a message for me, darling? Yes, of course there is. Bernard will get it for you if you give him your glass. If you <laughs> give him your glass, he'll get you some more orange juice as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Bernard. Humphrey here yet? Uh, yes, he's just over here. Oh, Mr. Good. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Traditional foreign office courtesy to our Arab hosts, isn't that right, Effendi? Uh, spot on, Humphrey. <laughs> is that right, Your Royal Highness? Yes, we regard it as a most warm and gracious compliment. May I present our minister, Mr. Hacker? This is Prince Mohammed. How do you do, Your Royal Highness? Pleased to meet you, Your Excellency. <laughs> Excellency. I, I think, if you'll excuse me, I just must have a quick word with Sir Humphrey. Uh, Please. Uh, Highness. I can't believe my eyes. What do you hear as? Alibaba? <laughs> minister, when in Rome. We are not in Rome. Humphrey, you look ridiculous. I suppose if we were in the Fiji Islands, you'd be dressed in a grass skirt. <laughs> the Foreign Office takes the view that, as the Arab nations are a very sensitive people, that we should show them whose side we're on. Well, it may come as a surprise to the Foreign Office, but you're supposed to be on our side. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes. Any um, messages in the communication? Oh, uh, well, there is one for Sir Humphrey, Minister. Oh, good, yes. Yes, the Soviet Embassy's on the line, Sir Humphrey, and Mr Smirnoff. <laughs> Stop it. I'm sure there isn't one for me. Oh, well, there was a message from the British Embassy compound, the school, a delegation of teachers. Oh. <laughs> Let's go and greet the teachers. <laughs> Before the bells goes. <laughs> Bell goes. Miss Minister, I agree with you. I see now that there is a moral dimension to everything. Will you tell the press about the communications room, or shall I? <laughs> you know, all the scotch in Qumran. <laughs> you mean to tell me that if, if I say... Th then you must tell... Uh, and drop me in the... In the... <laughs> in the moral dimension. <laughs> this is completely different. It's not the same thing at all. Why? Well, drinking, it's not corruption. No, it's just deceit, that's all. Deceit. We have deceived the Qumranis. I'm racked with guilt. <laughs> Tormented by the knowledge that we have violated their solemn and sacred Islamic law in their own country. Sooner or later, we'll have to own up and admit that it was all your idea. It wasn't. It was. <laughs> was it? Is it 50 lashes or 100? <laughs> Minister, I must ask you to meet this journalist or she'll write something terrible anyway. Oh, yes, yes, all right, yes. What am I going to say? Well, may I suggest that attack is the best form of defence? Yes, attack. Attack, yes. Good thinking, Humphrey. Yes, got it. Minister, may I introduce Miss Jenny Goodwin from the guard? Ah, oh, do come in. Sit down, won't you, Jenny? I may call you Jenny, may I not? If you like. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Two things, really, Minister. Mm -hmm. Both of them rather worrying to the public. Uh, the first is a story that you may have seen in the French press. It's about corruption in BES getting the Qumrani contract. Complete nonsense. But uh, they quoted reports of payments to officials. Really, this is absolutely typical. A British company slogs its guts out to win orders, create jobs, earn dollars, and what does it get from the media? A smear campaign. But if they won by bribery... There is no question of bribery. I've had a full internal inquiry. 
and all these so-called payments have been identified. What as? Ah. Commissioner fees, <laughs> administrative overheads. Operative costs, managerial surcharges. Your introduction expenses, miscellaneous outgoings. We have looked into every brown envelope. Every, <laughs> every account book and everything is completely in order. I see. And may I say one further thing? Allegations of this nature are symptomatic of a very sick society for which I'm afraid the media must take its share of the blame. The media? Why are you putting thousands of British jobs at risk? I am calling on the press council to censure the press for its appalling lack of professional standards in running this story. The council, and indeed the House of Commons, must be concerned about the standards which have applied in this disgraceful matter. And pressure will be brought to bear to make sure that this sort of gutter press reporting is not repeated. I see. <clears throat> well, um, there is this other question. It's about the uh, rosewater jar apparently presented to you in Qumran. Yes. Well, I saw it in your flat, actually. Well, yes, we're keeping it there, temporarily. Temporarily? Oh, yes, it's very valuable, you know. Mrs Hacker said that it was an imitation. Burglars, girl, burglars. <laughs> You've got some... <laughs> well, until we can get rid of it. Get rid of it? Yes, I'm presenting it to our local museum as soon as I get up to the constituency at the weekend. Well, I can't hold on to it, you know. It's government property. Now, what was your question? <laughs> The reason there has never been an integrated transport policy is that such a policy is in everybody's interest except the minister who creates it. Why? <laughs> now, how can I put it in a manner which is close to your heart? It is the ultimate vote loser. Vote loser? <laughs> Why do you think the transport secretary isn't doing it? Why do you think he suggested the Lord Privy Seal? Why do you think the Lord Privy Seal suggested the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster? And why do you think he suggested the Lord President of the Council? I didn't know all this. And why do you think they invited you to number 10 behind my back? Minister, this hideous appointment has been hurtling around Whitehall for the last three weeks like a grenade with the pin taken out. <laughs> if I could pull it off, it would be a feather in my cap. Well, if you pulled it off, Minister, it wouldn't be in your cafe. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. If you pull it off, Minister, no one will feel the benefits for ten years. And long before that, you and I will have moved on. Or up. Or out. <laughs> in the meantime, formulating policy means making choices. Once you do that, you please the people that you favour, but you infuriate everybody else. One vote gained, ten lost. Now, if you give the job to the road services, the rail board and unions will scream. If you give it to the railways, the road lobby will massacre you. And if you cut British Airways investment plans, they will hold a devastating press conference that same afternoon. But I'm going to be transport supremo. <laughs> I believe the civil service vernacular is transport muggins. <laughs> no, Humphrey. The Prime Minister has asked me to undertake this task, this necessary duty. And after all, we must all endeavour to do our duty. <laughs> Furthermore, Sir Mark thinks there may be votes in it. And if so, I don't intend to look a gift horse in the mouth. I put it to you, Minister, that you are looking a Trojan horse in the mouth. <laughs> but if we look closely at this gift horse, we'll find it's full of Trojans. Uh, if you had looked a Trojan horse in the mouth, Minister, you would have found Greeks inside. Hmm? But the point is, it was the Greeks who gave the Trojan horse to the Trojans. So, technically, it wasn't a Trojan horse at all. It was a Greek horse. <laughs> Hence the tag, to mio danio set dona ferentes, which you will recall is usually and somewhat inaccurately translated as beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Or doubtless you would have recalled had you not attended the LSE. <laughs> yes, well, I'm sure Greek tags are all very well in their way, but can we stick to the point, please? Oh, yes, sorry. Sorry, Greek tags? Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. I suppose the EEC equivalent would be... Beware of Greeks bearing an olive oil surplus. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Minister. No, I no point, well, I the point is, Minister, that just as the Trojan horse was in fact Greek, what you describe as a Greek tag is in fact Latin. It's obvious, really. The Greeks would never suggest be wearing of themselves, if one can use such a participle. Be wearing, that is. And it's clearly Latin, not because Timio ends in O, because the Greek first person also ends in O. <laughs> Though actually there is a Greek word, Timao, meaning I honour. But the OS ending is a nominative singular termination of the second declension in Greek and an accusative plural in Latin, of course. Though actually, Danios is not only the Greek for Greek, it's also the Latin for Greek. It's very interesting, really. 
Yes, I take your point, Humphrey, but is it really a fact? <laughs> well, Minister, perhaps... Perhaps you will allow me to prove it to you. I will arrange a preliminary conference for you with three undersecretaries from the Department of Transport, from the Roads Division, the Rail Division, and the Air Transport Division. Civil servants? What will that prove? Well, I think it may illustrate you some of the problems you will encounter. You may be right, Humphrey. But if I succeed, this could be my Falkland Islands. <laughs> and you could be General Galtieri. <laughs> What if the press should get hold of this, eh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> They'd have to have another leak inquiry. They won't really set up an inquiry, will they? Oh, bound to. <laughs> won't that be uh, embarrassing? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what leak inquiries are for. <laughs> Setting up. They don't actually conduct them. Oh, members may be appointed, but they'll probably never even meet. They'll certainly never report. How many leak inquiries can you recall, Bernard, that actually named the culprit? In round figures. Uh, well, if you wanted in round figures, none. <laughs> <laughs> they never report. If the culprit is a civil servant, it'd be unfair to publish. Politicians are there to take the rap. Um, if it was a politician, he still can't publish it because he'll disclose all the other leaks he knows of by his colleagues. But chiefly they can't publish because most leaks come from number 10. <laughs> the ship of state, Bernard, is the only ship that leaks from the top. <laughs> so... If the problem is a, a leaky PM, as in this case, the facts are difficult to get at and impossible to publish if you do. <laughs> uh, may I remind you, Minister, that gentleman from the press is waiting to see you. Ah, yes. Oh, well, I'll leave you then, Minister Schnack. Oh, uh, Humphrey. Minister. Have you got another copy of these new proposals? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm awfully absent-minded, you know. I'm always leaving documents lying around. <laughs> getting where I've put them. I do understand, Minister. <laughs> Another leak. This is extremely serious. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. This is almost approaching a disciplinary level. I do mm. so agree, don't you, Humphrey? Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> if only we could find the culprits. It would be a most serious matter for them. Perhaps uh, I can help there. I think that uh, if I were to use my influence, I could achieve a disclosure from the Times of how they got hold of your original transport plans. Oh? Really? I think I might be able to help there too, you know. Hmm? Indeed? Are you sure, Minister? Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel confident that I should be able to find out where the press got hold of the leak about the Prime Minister's opposition to our original plans. Of course, if it transpired that the leak came from the Prime Minister's own office, that'd be even more serious than a leak from a Cabinet Minister's private office, wouldn't it? I mean, the security implications alone. <laughs> 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 Perhaps we ought to call in the police, or perhaps MI5. MI5, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> a leak from the Prime Minister's office is very, very serious. Nevertheless, our first priority must be to investigate the original leak. No, no, surely our first priority must be to investigate a possible leak from number 10. At all events, the inevitable public outcry after all these leaks is going to make it awfully difficult for us to formulate an integrated national transport policy within the DAA. The time is unripe, the climate is unsuitable, the atmosphere is unfavourable. Our only two avenues of approach are now blocked. <laughs> I wonder mm -hmm. if it might not be wiser to take the whole matter back to the Department of Transport. Now that, Arnold, is a brilliant idea. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> There remains the question of the leaks. Indeed there does, and I do feel we ought to treat this with the utmost gravity. I think I may have a solution. Indeed. Will you please recommend to the Prime Minister that we set up an immediate leak inquiry? Yes. <laughs> yes, well, the PM has asked me to have a preliminary conversation and write a background note. Save time later. Well, I've been given some pretty dramatic information. Go on. The Italian red terrorist groups are being supplied with top-secret bomb detonators. 
made in this country in a government factory. And you feel you should tell the PM? Well, yes, the PM's head of security. Oh, I don't think it's anything to burden the PM with. Let's hold it over, shall we? You mean, forget all about it? That's my recommendation. I'm sorry, I think I can't accept it. The PM must be told. If the PM were to be told, there'd have to be an inquiry. Exactly. Which might perhaps reveal that all sorts of undesirable, even hostile governments, had been supplied with British-made arms. Are you serious? Oh, I said perhaps. Which might perhaps be highly embarrassing to some of our cabinet colleagues, foreign secretary, defence secretary, trade secretary, and to the PM personally. Yes, well, doing the right thing might be embarrassing sometimes, but that's not a very good reason for not doing it. You know we already sell arms to places like Syria, Chile, Iran. Yes, but that's officially approved. Quite. And you're happy about what they do with them? Well, obviously not entirely. Well, either you're in the arms business or you're not. Well, if being in it means arming murderers and terrorists, then we should be out. It's immoral. Oh, great! Great! <laughs> and is it moral to put 100,000 British workers out of a job? And what about the exports? Two billion pounds a year down the tube for, for starters. And what about the votes? Where do you think the government places all those weapons contracts? In marginal constituencies, obviously. Exactly. <laughs> Look, Vic, all I'm saying is that now that I know about it, the Prime Minister must be told. Why? Why? Just because you've caught something nasty, why do you have to wander about breathing over it? <laughs> Are you happy in the Cabinet? Yes, of course I am. And you want to stay in it? <laughs> oh, well. I'm sorry, Vic, but there is such a thing as duty. There are times when one must do what one's conscience tells one. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> must you go round flashing your petty, private, individual little conscience? Don't you think anybody else has got one? Haven't you got a conscience about the survival of the government? Oh, yes. Here's the PM on the verge of signing an international anti-terrorist agreement. Oh, I, I didn't know about that. Yes, there's a lot you don't know about. Can't you see that it's essential to deal with the major policy aspects rather than pick off a couple of little arms exporters and terrorist groups? Yes, I, I suppose it is just a couple of little terrorist groups. Well, they can't kill that many people, can they? I suppose not. <laughs> and you want to blow it all in a fit of moral self-indulgence. After all, with the PM thinking about you as the next foreign secretary? <laughs> you mean that? Good Lord. Still, if you want to martyr yourself, then go ahead and press for an inquiry. Feel free to jeopardise everything we've all fought for and worked for together all these years. No, 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 of course, well, obviously, I mean, it's appalling if Italian terrorists are getting hold of British weapons. But, as you said, there is such a thing as loyalty. You know, the, the common purpose. I suppose one, one must see these things in a, in a proper perspective. Oh, so with the Ministry of Defence or the Board of Trade? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, Ministry of Defence problem, Board of Trade problem, Foreign Office problem. <laughs> see that now? So we can hold it over for the time being, can we? Don't want to upset and embarrass the PM, do we? Absolutely not. <laughs> Definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mentioned it. <laughs> Good man. But someone in Britain is giving bombs to murderers. Uh, selling, not giving. Oh, that makes it OK. Now, be serious, Annie. An investigation might uncover all sorts of goings on. Oh, I see. It's all right to investigate if you might catch one criminal, but not if you might catch lots of them. Well, if they're your cabinet colleagues, yes, you're right. <laughs> now, you see, government is a very complex business, Annie. There are so many conflicting considerations. Like whether you do the right thing or the wrong thing. Exactly. No, no, no. <laughs> well... What do you suggest I should do? Take a moral stand. How? Threaten resignation. They'd accept it. <laughs> then where would I be? I mean, if they accept my resignation and I'm gone, I'm not in a position to do any good anymore, am well, I? You're not doing good now. Look, resignation may be a sop to my conscience and to yours, but it won't stop Italian terrorists getting British bombs. Well, it might if you threaten to tell what you know. Well, what do I know? I don't know any hard facts when they know it's going on, because nobody's denied it, but that's not proof. Don't you see? I'm in a real fix. I don't think you realise just how real a fix you're in. This letter arrived today from Major Saunders. Dear Mr Hacker, thank you for seeing me on Monday last. Such a relief to have told you about this ghastly business of the supply of British weapons to the Italian terrorists. 
I know you will act upon this information as you promised, and I look forward to seeing some action taken. You see? Now what will you do? When Major Saunders tells the world that he told you about this scandal and you did nothing. It's a photocopy. He's got the original. And it was recorded delivery, so you can't say you didn't get it. I'm trapped. <laughs> Completely trapped. I can't tell the PM. I can't not tell the PM. I see. I was just wondering, Minister, if we might not use the Rhodesia solution. <laughs> Bernard, you excel yourself. <laughs> of course, Minister, the Rhodesia solution. What are you talking about? Oil sanctions, remember? A member of the government was told about the way British companies were sanction busting. What did he do? He told the Prime Minister. What did he do? He told the Prime Minister in such a way that the Prime Minister didn't hear him. Oh. But you mean I should <laughs> mumble it or something in the division <laughs> line? Do you write a note? A very faint pencil. <laughs> Please, be practical. No, I Minister, mean, it's awfully obvious. You write a note which is susceptible of misinterpretation. Oh, I see. Dear Prime Minister, it has come to my attention that the Italian red terrorists are getting hold of British top-secret bomb-making equipment. How do you misinterpret that? You can't. Well, exactly. So you don't write that. You use a more circumspect style and you avoid any mention of bombs or terrorists or any of that sort of Wouldn't thing. Wouldn't that be rather difficult? Is that what it's all about? You say, Bernard, write this down. My attention has been drawn on a personal basis to information which suggests the possibility of certain irregularities under section... Section 1 of the Import, Export and Customs Powers Defence Act 1939C. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> you then go on to suggest that somebody else should do something about it. Prima facie evidence suggests that there could be a case for further investigation to establish whether or not inquiries should be put in hand. And then you smudge it all over. <laughs> Nevertheless, it should be stressed that available information is limited and relevant facts could be difficult to establish with any degree of certainty. I see. Then, if there were an inquiry, you'd be in the clear and everybody would understand that a busy PM might not have grasped the full implications of such a letter. You certainly would. That's most unclear. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> then, you arrange for the letter to arrive at number 10 on the day the PM leaves for an overseas summit. So there is also doubt about whether it was the PM or the acting PM who read the note. And so the whole thing is written off as a breakdown in communications. Everybody's in the clear and everybody can get on with their business. Including the red terrorists. Exactly. <laughs> we spoke to the curator. They get an average of 11 visitors a day. Anyway, it's a constituency matter. It's nothing to do with you or Whitehall. Why are you so interested in it? Uh, there is a question of principle. Principle? You know, what you used to tell me politics was about. <laughs> what principle? The principle of taking money away from the arts and putting it into things like football. A football club is a commercial operation. There is no cause for subsidising if it runs out of money. Why not? Why not? Yes, why not? There's no difference between subsidising football and subsidising art. Except that a lot more people are interested in football. <laughs> Our cultural heritage has to be preserved. For whom? For people like you, you mean? For the educated middle classes. Why should the rest of the country subsidise the pleasures of the middle class few? Theatre, opera, ballet. <laughs> Subsidising art in this country is nothing more than a middle class rip-off. Oh, Minister, how can you say such a thing? Subsidy is about education, preserving the pinnacles of our civilization. Or oh, hadn't you noticed? Don't patronise me, Humphrey. I believe in education too. I'm a graduate of the London School of Economics, may I remind you? <laughs> well, I'm... Um... Glad to learn that even the LSE is not totally opposed to education. <laughs> Nothing wrong with subsidising sport. Sport is educational. We have sex education too. Should we subsidise sex, perhaps? Oh, could we? <laughs> <laughs> Let us choose what we subsidise. By the extent of popular demand. There's nothing wrong with that. It's democratic. But, Minister, this is the thin end of the wedge. What would happen to the Royal Opera House on such a basis? Oh. The very summit of our cultural achievement. Yes, the Royal Opera House. Very good case in point. And what do they do? Mozart, Wagner, Verdi, Puccini. Germans and Italians. <laughs> Not our culture. <laughs> Why should we subsidise the culture of the Axis powers? <laughs> Our European partners, Minister. The Royal Opera House gets about nine and a half million pounds of public money every year. And for what? The public can't afford 30 pound seats, and if it could, they can't get them. There aren't enough of them. The vast majority of the audience consists almost entirely of big business executives, block booked by the banks and the oil companies and the multinationals and people like you. Royal Opera House is the establishment to play. Why should the working man on the terraces foot the bill for the gentry in the stalls who could perfectly well afford to pay for their own seats? Minister, I'm 
quite frankly appalled. This is savagery, barbarism. <laughs> that a minister of the crown should say these things, it, 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 it's, the, it's the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> as well as being a gross distortion of the truth. Distortion, you, eh? Art cannot survive without public subsidy. Did Shakespeare get a public subsidy? And what about films? Films are art, films are educational. Why does the establishment ignore the subsidising of films? Because people like you prefer opera. <laughs> we should be subsidising modern, relevant art like films that the man in the street sees and enjoys. Precisely. They are commercial. And now, if you will excuse me, I have to go early tonight. I can no longer continue with this appalling discussion. Why, where are you going? Uh, nowhere in particular. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> we must talk this through. I can't. I have to dress. Uh, <laughs> dress? Where are you going? Since you insist, I am going to the Royal Opera House. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Gala night, is it? <coughs> yes, it is, since you ask. Not so permanent secretary's going to be there. <laughs> Some, no doubt. Mm. Off you get, then. Yep. I don't want to make you late for your work's outing. <laughs> hey, hold on. How do you know about this before I do? Yeah, oh, I just happened to be with the cabinet secretary shortly after the decision was taken. See? Cabinet minister with the responsibility for the art, yes. eh? <laughs> oh, well, well. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Well, thank you for letting me know, Humphrey. Anything more? I'm just about to start a meeting. Oh, uh, the meeting, yes. Now, Minister, I do hope that you've considered the implications of your new appointment on the subject you're discussing. Rescuing a football club? No, 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 no. I was wondering how it would look if, as cabinet minister responsible for the arts, your first action would be to knock down an art gallery. <laughs> Quite a decent little art gallery, really. <laughs> exactly. Interesting building. Great, two listed. Uh, Minister, I do think you ought to start this meeting. Oh, my God. What have I got to say? Councillors Wilkinson, Noble and Greensmith. Ryan, good to see you. Please. <laughs> Doug, this is Humphrey Appleby, my Hello, permanent secretary. Gentlemen. You mean he's only a temp? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's going great, Jim. We've got all the political parties with us now and the County Council. All we need is your department's approval for using the proceeds from the sale of the art gallery as a loan to the club. Uh, well, I'm, I'm afraid there's a snag. You said there weren't any. Well, there is. What? Well, it's just that, well, it appears, well, it, it, it seems... <laughs> well, I should tell you, it, it, it has uh, emerged. <laughs> I think Sir Humphrey could explain this better than I could. <laughs> it can't be done, gentlemen. Um, the art gallery is... It's a trust. Terms of the original bequest or something. That's right, it's a trust. We should just have to knock something else down. <laughs> School, church, hospital... <laughs> Bound to be something. I can't believe this. You mean I've got to go and tell the people back home that you've gone back on your word? I mean, it was your own idea. But it's not me, it's the law. Well, why didn't you find out till now? Well, uh, <laughs> Let me be absolutely frank with you. <laughs> The truth is that it would be possible to push this through, just possible, but it would take an awful long time. OK, take the time. We've spent enough. Uh, but, but the trouble is, you see, something else would have to go by the board. And the thing that's taking my time at the moment is forcing through this increase in councillors' expenses and attendance allowances. And, you see, I can't put my personal weight behind both schemes. I suppose I could forget about the increased allowances for councillors. <laughs> Concentrate on the legal obstacles to the sale of the art gallery. Tricky things, legal obstacles. <laughs> and this is a particularly tricky one. And at the end of the day, you might still fail. 
Every possibility. Well, if that's the way it is, uh, there is a chance that we might want to close Edge Hill Road Primary at the end of the year. That site would fetch a couple of million, give or take. Well, there it is then. No ill feelings, Jim. <laughs> Good. Uh, and and you'll explain locally that we can't overcome the legal obstacles. Of course we will. <laughs> Uh, carry on with the good work, eh? <laughs> <laughs>